It's the Packet Froa! Welcome to the channel! Hello, in this video we're going to start introducing Software Defined WAN. This is one of the more popular parts of the SDN umbrella, and the idea here is we're going to be abstracting the internet connection so we can do some interesting things with it. Before we dive too deep into it, there was to explore how we got here. So traditionally, one of the main ways we connected our branch offices to our data center or our main office here is we would buy a MPOS link, and then we would put it at each branch. And then we would use a routing protocol to advertise the destinations down to the branches so that the branch one here would route through DC1, and then if it's going out to the internet, it would go through the firewall and out the internet. This worked great because we could just have a big central firewall or two if we want redundancy and everything was nice and secure because we didn't need to worry about uh, branch one getting on internet any other way because they didn't have actual internet connections. The downside to MPLS is for one, it is quite expensive. You can spend a fair amount of money on relatively small links there because the ISPs charge you for uh, service level agreements and the extra attention that they have to put into maintaining MPLS link there. And also in this model, we have the issue where because our firewall is up here, so that means if that uh, branch two's traffic is ultimately gonna be blocked by the firewall, we're still consuming the MPLS link here. And as I mentioned, this is not necessarily a gigabit link. This is going to be a 10, 20, 50 meg link there because you have to pay for the bandwidth. So then network people said, okay, well, what we're gonna do is just add in internet links to our branches here. And then all our internet traffic can route out through here. But if we have phone traffic or anything like that, we can route out through the MPLS link still. So we would just have say OSPF or something here. And then this would just be the default gateway pointing out. The downside here of this model is that if you're doing a proper design, you have to buy a proper firewall at each branch and this can get quite pricey. Though some businesses try and save money by just replacing the router here with a firewall. And that generally works well, but that's another can of worms that we don't really want to talk about right now. The benefit here though is because our internet traffic is going through the internet link, we could have a lower MPLS link there because we just have to do corporate traffic now instead of corporate and internet. Though this model does have some drawbacks because now we have to start paying attention to what is corporate traffic and what is internet traffic. This can be an easy decision, like I mentioned here, of doing a default gateway and then OSPF, but there are some corner cases there where if what if we wanted our Citrix traffic to go for the internet and not for the MPLS uh, we'd have to do some complicated things such as policy-based routing to try and make that happen there, or we would have to mess around with the routing tables if it's on a unique subnet. So things are starting to get a bit more complicated. Before SD-WAN blew up, the popular solution was DMVPN. And basically the idea here is that we purchase some internet connections. And what we do here is we buy an internet connection for a branch, and then we do a DMVPN tunnel between the main office or the data center, this is the hub router. Then from here, we would still run our routing protocols such as EIGRP or BGP. You typically don't want to run OSPF with uh, DMVPN because of the way the protocol is designed. So that's typically not the way you want to go. And then from here, it's basically the same thing as our central model there where, where everything routes through the DMVPN and then gets to the internet. Cisco's first SD-WAN solution was actually based on DVPN, and that was called Intelligent WAN, or IWAN. It was a pretty good solution for what it was there, because what it tried to do was it tried to add application awareness to this process, so that if it detected, say, that Citrix example I mentioned, then you could route it based on that using something called performance routing, or PFR. And basically what this did is it identified traffic with something called MBAR and then made performance decisions. The downside to this solution was ultimately that the hub here had to make all the decisions for all the spokes here and it just got a bit clumbersome. Cisco tried to make it easier with a solution called APIC-EM 
Well, frankly, while it was a decent SDN controller, the IWAN functionality on it was a little bit half-baked. And eventually Cisco decided to scrap it and ended up buying Viptela, which is the current SD-WAN solution. But if you want a really good resource on understanding uh, routing at a pretty deep level, I do recommend buying the IWAN book from Cisco Press. It covers a lot of the technologies that you don't normally see, such as um, such as a really good deep dive into DMVPN. It also covers things like the uh, WAS for WAN optimization and uh, really deep into NBAR and those kind of technologies. The SD-WAN solutions uh, goal is to simplify the earlier stuff I was talking about. The idea here is we're going to be abstracting the service provider, so it doesn't really matter if it's an MPLS or an internet link. And then we can define our policies on what traffic is important to us and let the solution figure it out. So for example, ISP1 can be an internet connection or ISP2 can be an MPLS, but it doesn't really matter. And if we want to add in more, we just need to keep adding ISPs. The main difference uh, compared to something like IWAM, which I was just talking about, is that uh, there is no concept of a hub router and there's no real spokes. Each box registers itself to the SD-WAN solution, which may be on-prem or may also be in the cloud. And then from there, we just define our site information. Like for example, we could say this is site 10, this is site 101, and this is site 102. And then we can define a routing policy from a abstraction level. This also provides a lot of nice automation for us there, so we don't have to necessarily change a bunch of ACLs or, or keep track of what we're doing for our policy-based routing so that we can make changes when the business requests something from us there. We can instead just uh, edit a simple policy and then the policy can be pushed to all the devices that are relevant to that change. It's also best of both worlds because if, if we decide that we want to route all traffic out to our data center, we can choose to do that. Or we can simply have all our internet traffic sent out locally and then all our, net, our, and then all our corporate traffic going for the DC VPNs. There are three main parts to the Cisco SD-WAN architecture. We have our management and this is typically a cluster of three vManage servers. And this is where we do all configuration once everything is set up. It's centrally managed and we get a visibility into all our devices that are in the SD-WAN network. The vSmart server's job is to enforce policy. So the idea here is you would set the routing policy on the vSmart and then it's going to advertise down to the edge devices. And then lastly, we have the vBond, and that's job is to orchestrate the connections so that the vEdge can reach your infrastructure. Your Edge device, which can be either a vEdge, which is running the old Viptela code. This is a completely different operating system than what you're used to on Cisco devices. Or you can run what's called a CEd, and this is running on top of iOS XC there. So this is a bit more familiar, and this is where all the development effort is going these days. But what happens is when these guys are configured, they will reach out to the vBond server. And the vBond server is going to get a list of approved edge devices from vManage. And if the device is allowed to connect, what's going to happen is that uh, the vBond is going to tell the edge devices how it can reach the vSmart so it can learn its policy information. It also proxies all your connections there so that uh, your vSmart and your vManage here do not necessarily need to be directly ac accessible from the internet there. Your edge devices only need to be able to reach the orchestration layer. There's also another box I didn't draw here, but this is part of the orchestration and it is called the ZTP, Zero Touch Provisioning. And the idea here is that when the devices boot up, they can contact Cisco's smart licensing. And if uh, Cisco is aware of the devices, it can point you automatically to the vBond there so that uh, you don't need to configure anything particular on the devices as long as they can reach the internet they can automatically register themselves to the vManage. This is handy if you just want to put a router in a box and ship it to a branch and without you having to put on a configuration first. Though this depends on your internet connection. Cisco also has an app that you can use for the iPhone and I believe the Android where you can connect to the devices with your phone and then they will learn their provisioning information. So the last thing I want to talk about before we start diving into building this is uh, what OMP is. OMP is the magic sauce for Viptela and this is basically their version of BGP where they've extended it to add in more SD-WAN relevant information. So the idea here is that when you set up your SD-WAN network, 
it's going to automatically form VPN tunnels there and advertise OMP information, what it gets from the vSmarts. And there's four main things that the OMP can advertise. So the easiest to understand is the routes or also known as vRoutes. And these are simply the routes on each branch that are going to be advertised. So these are your vRoutes. And likewise, this would be your vRoute. I'm just going to call this VR. So basically anything that you learn on your land side is going to potentially be advertised to all your other branches unless you do more complicated filtering. The next thing it advertises is what's called the transport locations or T-lock. And what this is, is uh, the next top information for your SD-WAN. So for example, if I had a system IP of 1.1.1.1 here, this would be advertised along with this route. Similar to a BGB community, when this guy sees that route, it can say, hey, I know I need to talk to 1.1.1.1 to get there, or conversely, this could be 1.1.1.2. And from here, this is where we can start building our routing policy. The service route is a bit more of an advanced topic, but essentially what it is, is I could advertise that this is a firewall to the SD-WAN solution there. And then, and then in my SD-WAN policy, I can say that if this guy wants to get on the internet, it has to go through and be inspected by this firewall first. So essentially what this does is uh, it takes a concept that you uh, traditionally see in ACI or uh, data center SDN solutions called uh, service insertion and allows you to uh, control where the traffic is going to go if you want to ensure that all traffic is inspected. The last thing to talk about is policies. This is more of a extra information there. If you're taking the CCMP or CCIA exam, it more wants you to know about these for the OMP routes. But the policy is basically the vSmart policy. It is the vSmart policy that can be advertised there. So for example, I could say that I want this to be a hub and spoke. And this can be a spoke. And I can do that simply by saying that I am only going to advertise these routes, I'm not going to advertise spoke routes. And then I just need to push a default route down so that all traffic has to reach the hub if it's trying to reach anything. So that's a simple example of the vSmart policy. We'll be talking about that a lot when we get deeper into this kind of stuff. To save some time, I went ahead and provisioned uh, a lot of the infrastructure, but I haven't configured anything. I went ahead and created some vEdge uh, devices so we can see how that looks like, and I created some Cisco Edge devices too there so we can see the iOS version. And then for the management, I created two vBonds there for our orchestration. I created three vManages there so we can do a proper cluster, and two vSmarts. Before you, uh, if you're building this on your own lab, there is one change you have to make to the vManage before you start using it. And what you need to do, and what you need to do is add a hard drive. And give it a decent amount of space. I like to give it 300. And what's gonna happen is when I boot this there, it's gonna complete the installation. So now that's done, I'm gonna go ahead and boot this. And then we'll have a look at the console. Okay, so here is our console. I'm just gonna go ahead and sign in. This is admin. Need to give that a little bit more time, apparently. There we go. So the first thing that it's going to have you do in modern versions is change your passwords. Let's go ahead and type in something. And then it wants to know where that hard drive storage is. So I only added the one, so I'm just going to add that. And yes. By the way, if you are going to do a cluster, the storage needs to be identical on all three sides there. So you can't have 300 gigs on two of the nodes and then have something different on the third there. You need to have 300 on all three of them or whatever number you choose. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to end the video here and then in the next one we'll dive into actually setting up the vCenter.